And the next speaker is Anne-Marie de Wild, and she is <laughs> historian and curator at the Amsterdam Museum. She has curated many exhibitions on topics that focus on daily life, urban conflicts and culture, migration and identity. Her exhibition projects include prostitution, Amsterdam songs, sailors, tattoos, football as a religion, animals in the city, neighborhood shops, graffiti, and the love-hate relation between Amsterdam and the House of Orange. And Mary has given many lectures and workshops in the Netherlands and abroad. She curated international projects like Football Hallelujah. She's a keen blogger and has published various books, catalogs, and many articles and blogs on the practice and dilemmas of curating. So I'm giving the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, being here. It's been so enriching, uh, both within the conference and all the conversations uh, uh, during meals and coffees and lunches. And I'm sure we'll continue with this. My presentation will focus on the way a city museum, like the Amsterdam Museum, um, deals with the city's conflicts and traumas. We are housed in a former orphanage, so trauma and emotions are, in a sense, in the part of the building, as uh, thousands of children uh, have lived here who must have, yeah, dearly missed their parents. Um, now, we are a city museum. We are housed here since 1975. We've got permanent exhibitions and temporary exhibitions. This is our Amsterdam uh, gallery. Um, it's free on the floor. It's a tapestry that represents the uh, 180 more or less different nationalities living in Amsterdam. So like New York, we are a very diverse city. Um, here in Istanbul, I feel like starting with a disclaimer. Amsterdam maybe is the proverbial free-thinking city. In the Netherlands, we have no laws against expressions of anti-nationality. And I always think this is a good example that Queen Beatrix was prepared to open an exhibition that uh, also showed the protest and the strong Republican feelings in the city like this poster that was made by the Squatters Movement when she became a queen. But of course, even in a country and in a city that prides itself on its freedom of thinking, there are things that are still unspeakable, as was the theme of the ICOM uh, Museum Day. My presentation provides examples of the way Amsterdam Museum has dealt with these difficult histories in and of the city, and how we work together with various groups in Amsterdam society in unveiling some of these hidden uh, stories. I do not only speak from a specific geographical position, but also in a moment in time. Museums have to change as society changes, although they not always change at the same speed. I think this is essential in the role of the museums. It's to tell stories about the connection between objects and people and places, while acknowledging that these relations and their meaning changes over time. And rather than focusing on one example of a difficult past, like yeah, some of the people we've heard before, I would like to talk about various themes, not a singular contested history, but plural history. I will say something about religion, about prostitution, homosexuality, the fate of the Amsterdam Jews, and about slavery. And of course, there are even more uh, contested histories than this. When talking about difficult paths, it's useful to talk about the concept of intersectionality, coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Intersectionality is about interacting axes of differences related to class, gender, skin color, ethnicity, age, legal status, being able or disabled. It makes us aware on both personal and institutional level how we are all positioned in a place of power or in a position of no power, a lacking of power. Intersectionality can also help to start conversations that do not shy away from our own lives. 
It helps to bring in focus all aspects of discrimination in ourselves, in our institutions, in our representations. And it also helps to understand why some issues are more important for some people than others. Bearing that in mind, and in no specific order, I'd like to talk about various themes related to the Amsterdam difficult pasts. Religion has been the cause of many disputes, quarrels and fights. The Dutch eight-year wars of the independence in the 16th and 17th century was partly caused by religious differences. And this Pieta, demolished during the so-called Bildenstorm, the iconoclasm of the late 16th century testifies to this. For centuries, the opposition between Protestants and Catholics has remained strong, although it also has led to finding ways of living together. These days, also in the Netherlands, Islam is the most contested religion. One of the points of debate is the headscarf. This small exhibition, which we mounted in 2006, was about headscarves and the stories of the women who wear them. They talked about headscarves, uh, and yeah, you could hear it on, on the, in the audio and video. They talked about headscarves as a contested piece of clothing, but also about the way it gave them freedom. And of course, and I think this was most surprising for the, for the women who don't wear headscarves, that it's also a fashion item. And recently we organized a discussion about the uh, niqab um, because of, of, of yeah, because it, they're talked now about this, uh, forbidding it in, in certain spaces uh, with people from outside the museum. And we also went through the museum and in this room they said, and, and I must say I absolutely agree with them, that it might be good to add a headscarf or maybe even a niqab in part of this religion room. Uh, in the text, we talk about contemporary conflicts, but it would be good to actually add this, um, add this object uh, to the room, maybe even next to the Vilt uh, statue. Um, in 2004, Theo van Gogh, filmmaker and writer, was murdered because of his anti-Islam statements. One could characterize, in a sense, his death to the Amsterdam 9-11. And after the murder, people left flowers, notes, and mementos on that place, but also got together there to discuss. And uh, like the New York Museum, we also went there to collect some of the mementos and the notes and with the city archives, uh, kept them, and now they're part of the permanent collection of the museum. When we exhibit difficult histories in the Amsterdam Museum, we like to include personal stories. For an exhibition on 400 years of prostitution in Amsterdam, we filmed an oral history interview with a, a prostitute who had worked in the red light district. We created um, a, a typical 1960s working space where visitors could enter to watch Henrietta's uh, uh, storytelling. And we've, I, will, I feel that empathy is stimulated when visitors actually become part of such a performative space. And the, the very matter of fact and sometimes humorous way she talked about her work made a big impression on visitors who maybe came with very you know, stereotyped ideas about sex work. The same happened with the other installation. This is, was created by an artist in 19... Uh, 89, Marike Verheijen, she worked together with uh, a, a prostitute and made a video recording of the point of the point of view, view of the prostitute with this endless stream of men passing by and shouting how much. And the installation uh, gives visitors the option to sit on a stool and experience how it may feel to be the object of these glances. Or to stand outside and as spectators with their shadows among the, the passers-by on the screen. But what to do when stories are too painful, uh, so people don't want them to make, be made public in, in, in a video or audio. Next autumn, we will show an installation called Tourist Attraction Number 1 by artist Jiminy Hignett, 
who interviewed victims of trafficking and then later asked actors and actresses to read these testimonies on camera. The experiences of people that are these days mostly referred to as LGBT or LGBTI are another example of hidden and often painful histories. The Amsterdam Museum has, compared to many other museums, a strong tradition of showing this history and this involvement with what was then called gay history started in uh, 1989 with a very popular exhibition on histories of gay and lesbians in the Netherlands. In our permanent ex presentation, we have a reconstruction of a, of a, a Amsterdam cafe at Mantje that was owned by a powerful lesbian woman, Bet van Beren, a, a predecessor of today's gay, gay bars. In the Amsterdam DNA gallery, we show the rings and tell the story of the first gay couple officially married in Amsterdam in 2001, since um, Amsterdam was the first city in the world where same-sex marriages were celebrated officially. And during the Gay Pride Week in Amsterdam, the Canal Pride, we host all kinds of activities in the courtyard of the museum. This is the former playground of the orphans and we do special tour through the museum. Some years ago, we, there was the first Moroccan boat in the Canal Pride, and uh, we decided to, uh, to acquire some of the costumes specially made for the collection of the museum. And recently, uh, our exhibition transmission about transgender experiences led to the acquisition of various personal objects and stories, um, like big size uh, heels, the first razor of a trans man um, that are now included in the collection of the museum, just like uh, two blocks of the Dutch AIDS memorial quilt. And last summer, there was a big international AIDS conference in Amsterdam. We even revived the way these quotes were unfolded in the past. Uh, thus, in a sense, yeah, documenting and recording the intangible heritage of these objects. And it was very moving for the people who were there. Uh, and some of them were actually recent refugees that had fled their home countries because of their sexual preference. I showed this picture bef painting before, it's, uh, um, and, and I show it now because of the word uh, mokum underneath this, uh, this, this tattooed lady, personification of Amsterdam. Mokum is a Hebrew word for place, and uh, it's, it's always been the, the word, had the, the, the name uh, Jewish uh, population gave to Amsterdam. Right now, it's become, it's, you know, the popular pet name of Amsterdam. And Amsterdam, of course, is, is, is a place um, where, which always has had a very large Jewish population. Um, they lived in a relatively tolerant environment. Jews could build synagogues, but in the 17th and 18th century, they were not allowed to join the guilds and which ex excluded most professions. Before the war, some 10% of the population uh, was Jewish, and added to that was, was, were, large, were some 40,000 in the whole of Holland of German Jews who uh, sought security in the Netherlands, including the family of Anne Frank. After the, yeah, this before the war. After the war, only 15,000 Jews uh, still lived in, in, in the 1950s, lived in Netherlands. But actually, it took decades before this great loss was acknowledged in museums and monuments. Um, in our museum, there are various places in Amsterdam, like the Anne Frank House, and, and now we also have a Holocaust Museum. In our story, we focus on, um, and, and this is, so this is also a story of perpetrators and, and, and bystanders, we focus on the role of the city authorities, the administration, the police, and the public transport. Um, they, had, they all played roles in the, in, in the deportation. This map, for instance, was made by civil servants on the request of the Germans uh, 
Pyers in 1941 who wanted to know where the Jewish pop Amsterdamers lived. And tram line number eight that ran through the Jewish neighborhoods was used to deport Jews to the central station. And after the war, it was decided that there would never be a tram eight again. Including in these various perspectives is also the story of a German soldier who died and was buried in Amsterdam under this swastika flag we hold in the collection. The most fiercely debated difficult past these days is around colonial history and the heritage of slavery. Amsterdam played a big role in slavery and slave trade. The palace in Paramaribo carried the Amsterdam coat of arms. The museum has made steps in acknowledging this dark history. Um, in an exhibition on uh, the Golden Age, uh, so-called Golden Age, we made in 2013, we created, together with descendants of enslaved, an intervention that showed their, yeah, their feelings and thoughts about this past. So also taking this yeah, contemporary feelings and emotions into account. Um, I'm one of the people who produced the Amsterdam Slavery Heritage Guide and uh, helped bring about the Black Amsterdam Heritage Tour. This is a boat tour that's created um, by uh, an American woman of Surinamese descent, Jennifer Tosh. Um, I, I often take, go, take part in the tours and, and uh, we, did, we often discuss about how to tell about this story and I find it very interesting. Jennifer also often says, uh, you have to serve the meal lukewarm. Eh? If your message is too harsh, people will are less likely to, to listen to it and, and, and let it sink in. Um, we also work with activists and grassroots organizations to encourage talking about this heritage uh, during walking tours and, for instance, also during this... Uh, um, special meal, the Ketikoti, breaking of the chains meal. But to decolonize the museum implies more. It means exploring and exposing how global geopolitical issues have consequences on a local level and vice versa. It questions the hegemonic Western canon. So we regularly organize uh, what we call new narrative tours and talks in the museum in which we invite people from outside to the museum to look at the collection from their perspective. Decolonization can also mean letting go of your total control of the collection, sharing authority. Um, also letting go really literally, also in the Netherlands, steps are being taken to return stolen objects. More and more museums and, and source communities having a shared responsibility towards the past and also towards objects. And this can result in networks of participatory meaning making. For the museum, this requires a redefinition of pro professional roles and expertise. An example of an object that links the museum uh, to the Surinamese community is, the, is this Cabra mask. It's a joint pro, uh, project of uh, an artist and a Winty priestess, which you see on the right on the photo. Um, Cabra refers to the ancestors in the Winty religion that developed among the enslaved in Suriname. Um, and what they created is a contemporary ancestor mask created through modern technology. Uh, a 3D scan, and um, Marianne's uh, ancestors uh, helped her to choose this particular Jeruba mask from the uh, collection of the Africa Museum. And the artist, Boris van Berkom, describes this act as liberating the statue from the storage of the museum. And they created a mask that can be used to dance with as a representation of the ancestors. It was first used as the commemoration of 150 years of ab abolition of slavery in 2013. Um, the museum acquired the mask, but stipulated that it could continue to dance and be present at ceremonies, which is quite rare for a museum object. It also means letting go of this control. 
And meanwhile, it has been in commemorations in the outside theater and uh, in documentaries, and it helped start conversations among this often taboo subject of the repressed Winti religion. Um, I showed already some public programs, of because of course exhibitions are not only the only way to talk, uh, to deal with contestation. In conversations, difficult subjects can be addressed in a more direct and a more interactive way. Um, the the program uh, Voices of Tolerance was developed together with our partner museum, Our Lord in the Attic. Um, poets and rappers get into conversations with young people about belonging, about identity, about what is tolerance and what do you do when someone is different. Um, and I mean, these are very, uh, yeah, very beautiful, very moving um, meetings. Um, I think it's also important, especially for us in the City Museum, to realize that you don't always have to program contested subjects in order to talk about difficult histories and about identities and what it means. Even through seemingly fun or easy subjects, one can approach uneasy themes and hidden stories. Through popular music, one can talk about poverty and exclusion and stereotyped images. An exhibition about shops can talk about how migration changed the landscape of shopping and food. Um, we made this exhibition about football and having an art and, and a rifle is part of your football identities. Uh, designer Floor Wesseling created these uh, football shirts that are mixed from opposite uh, clubs. And in the Netherlands, the rivalry between Amsterdam and Rotterdam, Ajax and Feyenoord, is very iconic. So the most confrontational object in our Football Hallelujah exhibition was this Ajax Feyenoord shirt. In Istanbul, probably this shirt that combines the Galatasaray, Fenerbahce and Besiktas would probably evoke strong emotions about rivalry. But it also may remind people of the Istanbul United March, that's of the supporters of the three clubs during the protests at Gezi Park. So some conclusions or rather questions, and some of them have been mentioned already before. The staff of many museums is not very representative of the cities. So how can we deal with all these complex, multi-diverse stories? Who is allowed to tell whose stories? Sarah already mentioned it. We like to call our museums contact zones, but are we aware that they may be uneasy for people who do not recognize themselves in the museum collections and staff? When is a space really safe enough to talk about difficult pasts and their repercussions for the present? How can we allow or even better invite criticism from outside? Be flexible, also with your collection there to show your collection outside the museum. Um, and finally, how can we move beyond a single narrative? Of course, this is easier said than done. Visitors want to make sense of the past. For marketing and communication, an easy message is easier to sell. So I think the big question of this whole conference is how can we address all these complexities? And I'm looking forward to continue talking about it with you. Thank you. Thank you.